Hey, you're the, you're the boss, yo. Good <laughs> show. Um, and people can log on when they can. So Allison Wieland here. I'm the account manager for PHCC. Thank you so much for joining our webinar. We have Al Shemansky here. He's going to go over 2020 code updates. Um, before uh, he takes off, I just wanted to remind everyone there was an email blast that went out for contractors. We're giving out the new 2020 code books. If you have not received it, please contact the office or um, Ron Doughty. If you don't have his information, I can provide it to you. Um, and that's about it. Everyone enjoy Alan Stramansky's presentation. Thank you so much for doing this too. You're all set, Al. I guess I'm on? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. This uh, night it's finding you all safe and uh, uh, well at this time. Uh, we've been going through some very trying times and especially for the tradespeople and stuff like that. So uh, I guess we have to switch to the, um, the new method now, uh, virtual uh education virtual understanding whatever you want to call it okay the first thing i'd like to do is just uh, help you understand that as of may 15th may 12th something like that uh, new york state adopted the new 2020 codes they are base rooted from the uh, uh ipc codes the 2018 i codes but however they uh new york being new york their own uh, addendums and amendments in them and changes in them and this year, it's a little different than, or this code cycle is a little different than other code cycles um, because they now have their own specifics. So, um, and if you have your, hopefully you have your code books with you, you can follow along, you're going to notice in your code books, um, the capital letters next to a lot of the uh, sections, why? That means that is only in the New York State codes and not in the 2018 or any IPC code, as a matter of fact, okay? Um, I, tonight, uh, due to the, the time limitation, I'm trying to go through all the updates in, in the plumbing code. Um, it's probably a five-hour course to do a mechanical and gas and everything. Um, so um, I'm going to take the uh, plumbing code. There has been a lot of changes to it. The first thing I'm, I'm not going to go over tonight, but I just want to bring your attention to, chapter one in your code books uh, is totally State, nothing else. There's no IPC in that, and uh, New York has their own specific. I usually like to go over that. I do that in everything, especially when it comes down to um, some of the things that um, are uh, afforded by the inspectors and, and the municipalities for um, uh, and get a code violations and stuff. Okay, what I like to do is uh, begin, and I'm going to start um, and. Uh, the first one, hopefully you, you got you got the, the screen sharing. Okay, so uh, oh play, okay. Okay, you should have the course information. That's just a, then we have say these are all for inspectors. This is a proof course is approved for inspectors for CEUs. Okay, the goal for this course, this the thing is uh, identifying changes in the 2015 codes. Um, and we're going to try to apply the code uh, requirements to design plans and submittals and inspections. The big thing you're going to find out, especially in single stack venting and uh, some of the standards that have done. Okay. And I will be pointing out very specific code sections. Okay. The object um, is um, uh, to identify the differences between the 2015 code and the 2020 codes and explain how changes impact design and install installation under the plumbing codes. Okay, so uh, we have some, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna move on to this, okay? Um, if we're gonna be successful today, hopefully, uh, the slides that you're seeing uh, have some, con uh, some text and iconic images, um, and it'll, it'll help you learn and understand some of the new stuff. Uh, text and commentary, I'll, I'll try to do the best I can with it. If you have any questions, you could probably use the chat button or what, and you can probably answer them at the end of it, okay? Um, and then we uh, can ask questions. The more questions you ask, the more answers we have, the better along goes. Okay, uh, chapter two is definitions. Always has been definitions, always will be definitions, okay? There are several new definitions in the code which really they're trying to bring all the codes into uh, some kind of uniformity. Uh, the first definition that is uh, brand new, it's brand new, is accessible. It's a, a site 
a building, a facility, or a portion thereof that complies with chapter 11 of the building code. Okay, so that means it's accessible. Okay, the reason they uh, did that is they wanted to add to eliminate the confusion between accessibility requirements for the disabled and access to requirements. So they just put in another new word. Building, uh, they put this as brand new too. Any structure utilized or intended for supporting or sheltering any occupancy. So for example, a storage shed would not be considered a building anymore or stuff like that. It has to have some type of occupancy, okay? Then you have a full opening valve. Uh, they uh, qualify this. Uh, we all know this has a gate valve, especially some of the old time, it says a gate valve. And we know that gate valves have very little restrictions, almost zero restrictions, something like 97% restriction. Uh, when water passes through it or anything. It's unlike the globe valve. The globe valve, um, that has 60% restrictions as it goes through it. And remember the globe gold valve, the, the globe valve um, does have an inlet and an outlet, which a lot of people don't realize sometimes. And the um, gate valve, which is a rising disc, the one in the picture is a rising disc. And uh, that one has to be fully open or fully closed. Now the reason they uh, have addressed this fully open valve is because we now have ball valves. And there are two types of ball valves. There are full, full opening ball valves and there are not full port ball valves, especially you guys that work on uh, heating systems. You know, there's full port uh, zone valve and a uh, regular uh, small zone valve and that affects your heating you bring. So they uh, help us with the, uh, or they definitely define the uh, full opening valve. Okay, the next one we have is um, uh, Pro Press or Press Connect fittings are now in the 2020 codes. There was always some, are they legal, are they not legal? I would get calls during the year, I can't use them, it's not in the code. Yes, they have been always in the, in, the eight, in the 15 code, they have been in there and you could use them. Now they just clarified it and uh, Pro Press clarification it is known as a permanent mechanical joint with a seal and it's made with a pressing tool. And um, you do have to have that pressing tool certified after so many swatches or whatever it is, the manufacturer will tell you that. Another big definition change is swimming pool. Uh, New York no longer recognizes public or private swimming pools or anything like that. They just come up with one definition of a swimming pool. They modified it and it includes public, private, or residential structures. Um, and the, the interesting thing about the uh, swimming pool definition is that uh, the, um, there's three different ones. There's one in the plumbing code, there's one in the residential code, and there's one in the building code, and all three of them are different. That's not a good thing, okay? Uh, if you look at the uh, building code one, it's called the structure basin. Uh, tank, which is intended for swimming, diving, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or capable of containing water 24 inches deep. That's the building code. Then you got the residential code, it's the same as the building, and then you have the one that I just showed you for the swimming. So they're, they're a little different. Um, the best thing to do is uh, if you deal with swimming pools a lot, is uh, if you're confused on which one it is, uh, you should go to um, uh, uh, your representative and find out um, which one you should use. That would probably be the best way to go about it. Okay, general regulations. Let's get into general regulations, chapter three. Okay. Where are we? How come most here? Okay, okay, general regulations. Okay, uh, third party certification. That's just telling you about that uh, materials have been certified. There have been a lot of new standards in this code. That's probably the biggest change. Standards and certifications and ASTM restrictions and stuff like that, very, very big change. Okay, uh, cast iron saw pipe and fittings, 3035. Uh, cast iron saw pipes and fittings um, and couplings used to join products together shall be third party labeled, third party certified or inspectors shall comply. This is basically for inspectors. They need to see that stamp of approval on cast iron pipe. I was myself on a job and uh, somebody got some um, two and three inch no hub in and it had no name on it. And he already did three buildings 
three, four story buildings. And uh, I looked at it and uh, we went over it and there was no labeling on it, no nothing. And unfortunately I was there for the water test. He chose to do a water test with all four buildings at the same time, one at a time. I allowed him to, and that was maybe it was my mistake or what, but uh, he had to rip that entire all four buildings out. I made him put all the cast iron in a separate pile and, uh, and a thing, and I wanted to see all the new cast iron come in. And what had happened is the supply house had shipped them from stuff from another, uh, another country, let's say. Uh, and uh, so that guy had to eat a lot. So anyway, so they have to have their name on it. Okay, 305, okay. Um, the protection against contact, uh, corrosion. Okay, um, metallic piping, except cast iron or ductile iron and galvanized steel shall not be placed in direct contact with steel framing members, concrete or cinder block walls. Okay. So they're making a distinction here, here now of metallic piping shall be placed in direct contact with corrosive shore, shall not be, excuse me. That is the key change in that, okay? Um, a lot of people say galvanized pipe is okay outdoors underground without drugs. That's not true. Number one today, I don't know, uh, unless it's specialized piping, where we use galvanized pipe. It's all zinc coated pipe and it's a, uh, plated zinc and you can tell by the way it flakes and stuff like that. So even galvanized pipe needs to, when it comes to contact underground, it needs to have some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of um, protection, we'll say, okay? Okay, um, let's go on to the next one. Um, those of you guys who do chillers and heating lines on the ground and stuff like this, this is the type of protection you guys use. You have a hard casing, a plastic casing, a foam in it, and then you have the metal pipe. Um, that's the heat. You have to have the foam in there if you, 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 you have a delta or heat heating or chilling factor in there that has to be insulated or otherwise your pipe really doesn't have to be um, insulated. Uh, sleeping on the ground is um, an acceptable method as well if you don't have heat, of course. Um, by the way, hot water pipes do have to have insulation in the ground. The importance is not to allow contact with corrosive soil or water seeping into the joints is the big thing. And we all know it when we use this, the, 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 sleeve, the sleeving material here. Um, when you use the sheathing, which that's what the stuff over there is called and the slide, the sheathing, it is important to allow for the movement of the piping material. The uh, pipe should move freely through it. It can go back and forth and there should be no joints on the ground if possible. So for example, if you got a 150 foot run of piping on the ground and uh, they make a 200 foot roll of sleeving, you have to use the 200 foot roll. You can't use a hundred and then 50 of the next one and splice it, okay? That's, um, that's uh, what they're looking for, okay? Uh, the next section here in general regulations is kind of a modification. Um, we're talking about the minimum clearance from the face of the framing member. It has been reduced for pipes passing through holes and notches. Um, it's an inch and a quarter, okay? I have it highlighted there, but I need to help you be aware that in the mechanical code, it's still an inch and a half. In the 2020 mechanical code, it's still an inch and a half. And in the fuel gas code, they now require an inch and three quarters. So that's, that's a big, uh, a very big difference, okay? Um, and again, you have to use number 16 gauge plates here. Um, just one of the things I'd like to help you be aware of is um, as I uh, uh, do some of these courses and some of the inspectors call me and ask me up, um, they ask me what I do when I go to a job and uh, they're putting the face plates on then. I, I tell them I walk off the job, I go, I leave, I don't wait. Um, and the thing with the face plates, and, and you guys really gotta pay attention to them, is they have to cover the entire area. Most of these guys put face plates up in two seconds and half of them don't cover half the pipe. So uh, anyway, so I think you, you know what I mean. <clears throat> these are some of the types of the approved face plates that we use or the cover plates, the nailing plates you call them. Okay, um, the, 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 the typical SS15 installations are when you have beams together or you're, you're notching beams 
or you're uh, boring holes in beams and you're cutting more out, you must use that type of clamp in the upper right hand corner uh, to give support to the wall, especially if it's a bearing wall, okay? Uh, and then the other ones, you got the tie-in clamps that uh, they need to be below and at the sole plate and at the top plate of the material. That's gonna be something that's gonna come in. Now, both the plumbing inspector and the building inspector look at them. Usually the building inspector, if there is a building inspector on the job, he will look at the plate face plating. Um, the plumbing inspector, if there's no building permit, he would use, um, he would do that type of work, okay? Um, this, unfortunately, they took this out of the code. This is uh, the guideline for structural safety it's in, in chapter three. And uh, it used to be in the appendix in the back in chapter four. And he gave you a guideline of the size and the cutting of the holes. I, I put this in here. This is from the 2010 plumbing code. It was not even in the 2015. And um, I like to have this, and I like to show this. And again, uh, if you look in the uh, second drawer in the upper right-hand corner, okay, um, let me just see if I can still do this. this. This drawing here, see these walls here? Okay, they're double-notch beams, okay? Um, if you read the section carefully, it says you can't notch more than two sets of double-notch beams. And one, it's their bearing wall, of course, that's what I'm saying, it's a bearing wall. And once you go through two, you can't put any more. So that's, that's the limit on notching. It's uh, pretty strict on that. Okay. All right, let's go on. No questions. Okay. Sway bracing. Okay. That gets, that gets confused with a lot of types of seismic support and stuff like that. Uh, sway bracing, anytime you have a pipe four inches or larger and you're hanging it, a drainage or waste pipe, and where pipe uh, fittings that interchanges changes the direction greater than 45 degrees, you must use it so it don't move back and forth, okay? Um, and the real purpose of that is in case of a fire or something like that happens, a little earthquake, uh, the heat from the building or the heat from the pipe, the sways, and with, uh, with the drainage fittings, they usually come down, break, and they don't want it to fall on the uh, rescue workers, the, uh, the first responders. So that's one of the main reasons why um, sway bracing come into effect. This here is a very good sway bracing job right here. They usually, uh, the architect usually tells them, this is my pet peeve, uh, okay? Um, these are actual job, a couple of job photos, okay? Uh, thermal expansion tank. The code now is pretty, pretty um, strict on this now, or they, they come out with it pretty good on, on the, the tanks, okay? If you look at a thermal expansion tank, they cannot bear the weight of the pipe, okay? Uh, they must be on their own. Uh, and if you can see the one in the lower left corner, that's a really good job, perfect job. The one in the center, that's, you see that all the time. You still see that and everything. Uh, got, I got a couple of guys on that one still. They still put them up like that. Or on the heating system, they put them straight up on the thing. The other one on the right, I don't know what you think about that. Um, as an inspector, I walk in, I see that, and I will uh, give you a violation because that type of band iron corrodes, as you can see, that's pretty new and it's almost all corroded. And in a period of time, that would all corrode. Now, if you use copper plated band iron, or maybe, or something like that, I, I, I don't know. But it is supporting, it's not supporting the weight, but I would get you on corrosion of the material. Be interesting uh, what you say about that. Okay, uh, so let's go on. Okay. I don't know if you guys want me to answer questions now or, or later or how you want to do that. If Allison, you could chime in. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, you can ask them in the chat. Okay. Yeah, if you have any questions, just answer them. Okay. Chapter three, spacing. Okay. There's uh, two new things in the, in the code on spacing or hangers in the uh, chapter three. It's for PEX pipe and PEX. Uh, uh, rated pipe, okay. Um, it has space based on size of, on the size of pipe. They broke it up. It used to be one. So now, depending on the size you have, depends on the distance of the spacing. And please always remember that little footnote is very important. You'll find it on the bottom of your chart, uh, 10B. It tells you about mid-story guides and stuff like that. A mid-story guide is not a hanger. It is just something to keep the pipe from swinging back and forth, but yet it is 
has to be there in story guides. In table 4031, and I didn't print on the table, only the two major changes in it. They added casinos, okay? Uh, and they added um, in uh, number two, which I don't show, but you should have it in your books there. In business, they added the uh, ambulatory care on the description. Um, if you notice, uh, there is also a section taken out of this of occupancy is no longer in this and they shortened it up and the other thing. Um, another thing I, I'd like to uh, point out is in the footnote on this table is uh, service things are no re longer required in every single commercial dwelling. Okay, they have a, a, a number on it so uh, or on every floor. So that's something else that they and that's in the footnotes. The footnotes on charts are very, very important. Chapter four, fixtures and calculations. Okay. Uh, fixture calculations. I, I don't know. We usually don't get involved in this. This is all usually the, uh, the designers and stuff like that. However, uh, each sex has a fixture ratio for fixtures, and each fixture type shall be applied to the occupant load. Okay, um, in, in, the new, in section 403.1 and 403.2, uh, this is exclusive to New York State only, uh, and it was rewritten to modify the calculation and determine the load for the sexes, okay? Um, note, the important note here is in the second paragraph, um, if you have a single user toilet or bathing room or a family assisted toilet, okay, single use is the key word here, shall contribute towards the total number of required fixtures. In other words, they count towards the number of required fixtures, okay? Um, the interesting thing is um, when you calculate it, anytime you come over with more than one, so let's say you calculate three, uh, um, uh, you divide it up and it comes out to three and a half water closets for the men's room. Now you can't put three and a half, you put four in. And if the same woman's run back to back as four and a half, you have to put five. So you always have to round off the partial to the next higher one, okay? So, and it, you can count the things. So usually what they do or what we've been doing is uh, when you get that half bathroom um, or that half a thing on both of them, they usually put a single use, uh, family use or whatever you want and whatever you want to call it, okay? Uh, Okay, uh, exception, uh, look at that exception in, in, in figure four, okay, uh, in uh, 40311. The total occupant load shall not require to be divided in half where approved statistical data indicates a distribution of sexes other than 50%. I think the important thing on that one is theaters and stadiums and, and stuff like that. They have a lot, of, the code official has a lot more uh, leniency to go either way. Um, I was to the Westchester Dinner Theater a while back. And if you guys ever been there, you take a break or any theater, you take a break and the women's room is crowded all the way down the aisle into the theater and the men's rooms are empty. What they did is they actually were smart. They closed the men's room for men and let the women use. So it worked out pretty good. Um, and New York did one other good thing here on 40312. That again is New York exclusive. A uh, single user toilet facilities and bathing rooms and family assisted toilet bathing rooms shall be identified for use by either sex. So what they're saying is that uh, number one, you have to, you have, to have uh, men or women restroom on it. It don't matter. It, it could be, uh, uh, what we used to call unisex or something like that. We used to call it years ago and stuff like that. So, uh, but it is uni, uh, uh, unisex, okay? Uh, and the men or women. Um, so, uh, and that, that's good. I, I like that thing anyway, okay? Or they call it an all gender restroom. That's the new science. By the way, that slide you see is again, exclusive to New York State. They're the only ones that have this type of uh, restroom. This is code. In other words, if you guys are doing jobs now, as of May 15th, if your plans were approved and everything, these are the type of that have to go on to the restroom. The, the only sign, if you notice the wheelchair signs, they, they're called leaning wheelchair signs. It's now they got tilt up type wheelchairs. And uh, that's, that's the new signs. And the state keeps asking me to, uh, whenever I do the presentation, to emphasize that, okay? All right, 
multi-use bathing, bathing facilities, okay? Where multi-use facilities design, all genders are provided urinals. Okay, that's interesting. These serve all genders are provided urinals shall be either located in stalls or located in areas visually separated from the remainder of the facility. Okay, now we'll talk about that a little later on down the road. Uh, same thing with laboratory distributions. What we do is we have to, again, I explained to you, there's no such thing as halves. You always go to the next higher number. 4032, separate facilities. Okay. Separate facilities, exception number four is new. The other ones are the same, they're, they're a carryover. Number four is new. It says separate facilities shall not be required in business occupancies in which maximum occupant load is 25 or fewer. If I remember right from the last code, I think it was 15% fewer, they increased it. So separate facilities are um, uh, not required, okay? Let's go on to the next one. Okay. Single unit toilets. Uh, separate, a uh, single unit toilet bedroom provided according to the shall be gender neutral. Okay, in other words, it could be either or. No, you don't put men and women's sign, you put men and women or anyone. Okay, whatever you want to call yourself. Put a question mark there, it's okay too. Separate facility, no, don't do that. Separate facilities shall not be required where multi user facilities designed for both sexes are provided in accordance with 40312. You would have to go back. And, and see what that says because it's uh, what we just covered. 4033, employee and public toilet facilities. Uh, this is a change, this is a big change. For structures and tenant spaces intended for public utilization, customers, patrons, and visitors shall be provided with public toilet facilities. Employees associated with the structures and tenant spaces shall be provided with toilet facilities. The number of Pictures located, blah blah blah. It's all the same. Here, e uh, employee toilets shall be either separate or combined. Okay, so 403. What they're telling you is this is stating that toilet facilities now do not have to be in the same building or tenant space. Okay, uh, toilet facilities may be in other buildings. For example, an amusement you're going to find the toilets in a different facility in an open mall. You may have to go across. The mall to get the building, covered malls, so factory outlets, stuff like that. So they're saying that the, the restroom does not have to be in that tenant space, but you can have a dedicated restroom facility right outside. So that's new. That's, uh, that we've been doing it, but that's been exceptions. Okay. <clears throat> uh, 4033 uh, is an addition. That's the uh, exception. The exception number one is an addition. Okay. Uh, parking garages operated without parking. At you do, you do not have to have toilet facilities in a parking garage that do, does not have attendance. Okay, uh, the next one in 4034, uh, that's an addition as well in signage. Um, and it's by, uh, under section 111 of the building code. It says uh, one and two are totally new. Single user facilities shall be designed as gender neutral. Multi-user facilities designed to serve all genders shall not be designated by sex. Okay, we have a 405.3. Water closets, urinals, and okay, this is, this is brand new. This is, I don't know what your reaction is gonna be on this one, okay? Uh, water closets, you know, 15 inches, all that, but if you go to the second sentence, it's uh, highlighted, you can see it. Where partitions or other instructions do not separate adjacent fixtures, where fixtures shall not be set closer than 30 inches center center between the date Jason Shore, there shall be not less than a 21 inch clearance of a water closet in front of a water closet urinal. And they put the word of up because uh, they, they, they were trying to skimp on that. They were putting 16 and 18 because it wasn't clear in the 15 code. So they changed that word, okay? So everything has to now have that that uh, 30 inch space in the center and a 21 inch space in the, in the center, okay? Um, and the exception is of course, they put this as new to the exception, um, is the children's water closet. They will be set not closer than 12 inches from its center to require petition and that, and you only 
Do you, uh, you guys do any uh, child cares and stuff like that? You know, they ha also have a separate code. That code supersedes really this code because it's more restrictive. <clears throat> again, this is your uh, clearance, fix your clearance allowance. Again, they took it out of the code for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, I always used to like to refer to it, but you can see a 21 inch distance, especially in that laboratory in the upper right hand corner. Okay, you can see that, that from that end laboratory, from the side of the laboratory uh, uh, cabinet, it's 21 inches. Uh, it all has to be, if you look at the laboratory that's in that bathroom in the insert, again, from the front of the bowl. By the way, that's to the very tip of the bowl, not the ceramic. If you have a super big toilet seat, water closet seat, it would be from the edge of the wall, the overhangs included. Okay. Uh, so that's it. And you can see our water, our lavatories are 30 inches center to center of the drains. Okay. And every center to center. Okay. That's if there's no petitions. Of course, if there's petitions, you got to add on for that petition. <clears throat> okay. Urinals. This is new. Okay. And this has caused a lot of uh, controversy. Each urinal utilized for public employees shall occupy a separate area with walls or petitions. Okay, let me read that again. Each urinal utilized by public employees shall occupy a separate area with walls or petitions to provide privacy. In other words, you have to have a privacy screen by a urinal. The horizontal dimension between walls and petition at each urinal shall be not less than 30 inches, same as the water closet, okay? And then they give you the height above and out and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, all the way, that's all pretty much the same when it comes to all of the urinals, okay? Now, I wanna show you this slide, okay? That's the typical uh, 2015, uh, that's 2020 code installation of urinals, every one of them. If you remember years ago, um, years ago, not too long ago, they used to have, I think it was American City, Cole, or just some of them, they had that uh, ceramic lip that came out and that they used to say was a privacy screen. That is no longer acceptable as a privacy screen. It does not meet the uh, regulations of the, um, the code that we just read. I wonder if any of you can identify that fixture that's in the lower right-hand corner of that. I would like uh, if you guys could chat me back and tell me what you think it is. Maybe we get back to that later. But uh, that's, uh, uh, and you can, if you look at it carefully, it's not a brand new installation. So that fixture has been around for quite a while. Okay, floor changes. Okay, uh, minor word changes. Um, by the way, I'm gonna tell you now, and you're gonna see this um, um, in, in a couple of places. The word brass is no longer in the plumbing code. They've taken out the word brass. There's no brass pipe. There's no brass floor flanges, no brass fittings, okay? They've changed it to copper alloy. Those are the new terms. So if you look up a standard for red brass, you're not gonna find it. You're gonna have to go and find the ASTM or the rating or the NSF 61 number for copper alloy. <clears throat> okay, uh, plumbing fixtures and pump waste. A lot of changes in the code on, in, in this section here on, on, on that. So um, I'll take some time on that. Plumbing fixtures with a pump waste shall comply with, and every pump waste shall have that number on it. The tank, you have it, uh, what do they call them? The, the little giant pumps and stuff. I mean, fixture with the pump way shall be installed in accordance with the manufacturer's installation structure. Now, when it says that, that don't mean to put the plumbing of it. They're just talking about connecting the tank and what it has to be in half. The plumbing has to be by the plumbing code. <clears throat> These are some different stuff. Um, I, I'm sure you all use them. I've used all of them and every one of them. Please remember the, the pump that had, they have traps on them. Some of them, some of them do not have traps on them, okay? Um, if you look at the water closet, um, I'd like to uh, see if I can point something out to you here. Let me just get this annotation up here. If you look here, uh, oh, there it is. There it is, okay. If you come around here, that's an outlet for that pump. Usually you connect the shower to that. You can connect the shower to that. You just gotta raise the base up. If you look over here, this here is the pipe over here for the lavatory. And then the water closet comes directly in here and you got your vent going up. Okay. Now these type of systems uh, are becoming very popular. 
between these and the macerating uh, toilets and everything uh, because they take up no room. They're easy to install. You don't have to dig up the hole and injector pumps are really on their way out. Um, and that's a kitchen sink with a pump. And it's easy to get plumbing in if you use that because you can bring it up to the ceiling, run it over and stuff like that. So they are finding that these here are uh, becoming more and more popular. <clears throat> Okay, next section we want to deal with is approvals, okay, for dishwashers. Um, the, uh, again, the NSF rating has changed to 184. Dishwashers have totally changed. Um, 4094, it says, for residential dishwasher connection, shall connect directly to a Y branch fitting on the tailpiece or the kitchen sink. Okay, if you guys are still awake, there's only one legal tailpiece. That's in those three drawings. One would be the chrome one, two is the brass one, and three is the plastic one. Which one do you think it is? Give me a chat bag or let me know. One, two, or three. Okay, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I guess I'm going to tell you anyway. Okay, the only legal tailpiece there is the plastic one. That's the only one that enters at a Y angle. The, although the, the, the brass one is on a Y angle and it has a 45 bend to make it a long term TY. If you look at them, they're illegal because they're only half inch copper, okay? So the interior, di interior diameter is half inch, which means that's not good for the washing machines. All our washing machines today are 5 8 discharge. So you better read your washing machine instructions. If you remember Bosch a while back had a, a lot of problems with their machines when they came out, they were so quiet, they were jamming, they were burning out their uh, check valves, burning out their motors. And because uh, uh, the plumbers, uh, they stopped their warranties on them because the plumbers weren't installing correctly um, because everything was getting blocked up at that entrance and uh, they were burning out their pumps. So um, they now specify that you um, have a 5 8 inch opening. Um, and that uh, chrome one is actually at a T angle. It's not at a Y angle. The plastic one, if you notice, that's a retrofit. Okay. Um, that's 5'8 on a Y, then it has a half inch. In case you're doing a retro and you got the old fashioned dishwasher, you're supposed to cut that half inch off. I can't tell you how many people don't. Okay? You're supposed to cut it off with your cutter and put the 5'8 hose on in. No, they just split 5'8 hose and shrink it down. Okay? Anyway, that's when you have problems with your dishwasher. <clears throat> Emergency eyewash stations. Okay? Um, for you guys up here, I guess you've been doing it for a while. Um, in Florida and other parts of the country, this, this doesn't even affect us. Um, now you have to supply hot and cold water to an emergency eyewash station. The temperature of the water shall only be controlled by a temperature actuated mixing valve. So, which means to me, you're probably gonna have to have a recirculating line there to keep it keep going so you have a consistent temperature, okay? Um, so that's with the eyewash stations. Uh, in Florida, our water comes out of the ground at about 70, 72, sometimes warmer. So they feel that we don't need the hot water. So we just have uh, eyewash stations uh, and they just uh, are fine. They find that people with um, the reason you can't have cold water is because a lot of times when people uh, would get burnt with acid or something, they go under these and wash out. The cold water sometimes is so cold that the shock they went into was worse than the actual uh, problem they had. So that was interesting. <clears throat> okay, faucets and other fixtures. Temperature actuated flow reduction devices for individual fixtures. Uh, just remember, this, this is not the residential code we're doing, this is the commercial code. Temperature actuated flow reduction devices were installed for individual fixtures shall conform to AS 1062. And here's the change. Okay, the temperature actuated flow reduction devices shall be approved method for limiting the water temperature to not greater than 120 degrees at the outlet of the faucet or fixture. That's the uh, um, uh, certain fixtures. Each fixture has a different temperature, so you have to do that. They've addressed head shampoo sinks now for a change. Okay. Head shampoo sinks now must have at each faucet, besides the uh, uh, tempering valve, shall have integral check valve 
to prevent cross connection between the hot and cold water. Okay, um, and that's those little things that go on the speedy connectors or whatever you have with the ball bearings. There's a couple of different types out there. Okay, but they're in the code now. Okay, on head shampoo sinks. This is a new section, by the way. They took this out of another place. They put it in here, and they they uh, <clears throat> they redid the entire uh, section. Okay, uh, section four fifteen. Um, uh, flushing devices for water closet. Really, the only thing they want to have access for it, which uh, is okay. Uh, section four twenty two healthcare plumbing has totally been taken out of the code. These are the check valves I was talking about. Okay, they go under the and the stops. They have little stops to stop the water from going back and forth. Okay, um, if you look at the residential code, it also says that, but that's really one of the things that isn't really uh, enforced. <clears throat> Foot baths and pedicure baths. Again, this is another one that has been um, um, what we would say uh, neglected over the uh, several years. A water supply to specialty plumbing is 120 degrees with a temperature limiting device that forms to form a mat. Okay, so that would be the temper temperature valve again for foot baths and pedicure baths. Okay, substitution for water closets. Okay, 67%, okay, for males. Um, the only thing that's changed there is where you can do it now, okay? You can do 67% for males if it's an assembly place or an educational occupancy. All others, you do 50%, okay? Which kind of makes a little more sense, I guess. <clears throat> Those are the type, different types of... Um, um, pressure limiting devices that are approved. They go under laboratories, they go under anywhere um, and they connect with speedy supplies and everything. And some of them even have built-in check valves. By the way, uh, if you guys are using that grand force pump that uh, injects uh, hot water into the cold water system, uh, I, code doesn't allow that. I, I can't find that anywhere. It's been asking me for several times and I can't find it. Okay, so just be careful with that. Okay, um, if you have any information on that, you want to give them to me, I would really appreciate that. Okay, now let me, see. okay, so let's get on. Uh, okay, any questions? You just put them in the chat. You hit that chat button, the chat sign will come up. And bingo, you should probably know that. Okay. Uh, requirements for discharge piping, water heaters. Again, you're always going to have every every code cycle, there's something going on with water heaters, okay? Requirements for discharge piping. Number 14 has been added. Okay, number 14 is added to discharge piping. Okay, be one nominal size larger than the size of the relief valve outlet where the relief valve discharge piping is installed with inserts fittings. So if you're doing inserts with PEX or whatever, you're bringing your thing down, uh, you're not gonna use three quarter anymore, you're gonna use the next size up or the next size larger, okay? Um, and that has, that's what you have to do to meet code. Uh, by the way, that was also there in 15 because of restrictions, but the code just clarifies it. Okay, uh, pans. Okay, another change. Okay, in pans, now we really, um, we have hot water that's going to cause damage. The code says you're supposed to use <clears throat> um, pans to catch the drippings. Okay, you know, it's not going to stop a flood, it's going to stop the drippage or leakage in the tank and hopefully give you enough time. Okay, uh, one has Number two is new, it's classic. They give you a thickness now of 36 inches in thickness, okay? And it has to have a, a rating on the back of it, okay? And or any other approved type material. You can make your own with uh, vinyl or lead or whatever you want to do, okay? However, the plastic pan cannot be installed beneath a gas-fired water heater and a mechanical code will tell you or an oil-fired water heater. Okay, so neither one of them can you do. Okay. Water supply and distribution, chapter six. This is this has been only put in there. It's New York um, exclusive because it's basically well water. 
And this is basically for areas that don't have uh, any uh, authority or things. They just put it in there for the inspector, that's something to go by. So um, you, 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 you doesn't really uh, affect most of us anyway, unless you're in Putnam County. Okay, again, disinfection of the water system. Okay. Um, private wells are regulated by the Department of Health. Um, and hopefully, I think I've mentioned this the last time, and, I, and they've asked me to mention this all the time, at least some of the guys from the Well Water Works Association. Um, it's illegal for a licensed plumber to go into a well and change a pump. You have to have a pump, a well license. Okay. Uh, so you can't change the pipe, you can't change the wire, you can't change anything. You need to have a well license to go into the pump or pump license, okay, to go into the casings of a well. <clears throat> That's New York State. That's in the eight, uh, 2020 plumbing code. Um, in section 604, the design of the building water distribution system, they have changed table 6044. Okay, it's again, this is a specific table. It's the only find that it's found in the 2020 New York codes. And the reason they did this is they're going to more green code, which you, you, you hear about a lot of things in here so far we've talked about is going towards more green code. The rates for private laboratories, showerheads, and urinals have decreased again. Pretty soon you're not going to be able to take a shower. <clears throat> okay, and uh, footnote C has been added. The flush volume for a dual flush water closet is defined as the composite average of flush valve of two reduced flushes and one full flush, okay? So uh, again, it don't change the fixed unit value or anything. It's just talking about that. If you get that, it really uh, is not gonna make a, a big difference one way or the other. But they have become very, very big in residential uses uh, is the dual flush. <clears throat> Okay, and uh, those are a list of tables there in 6053 water service type. Uh, nothing's really changed, it's standards. And again, if you look at 6058 manufactured pipe nipples, you don't have brass anymore, you have copper alloy added. Um, and, and 60511 to 60514 materials, brass has totally been deleted. Okay, uh, 60537 uh, pushed. Push fit joints have uh, been added. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the interesting thing here is it says you have to install them according to the manufacturer's installation instructions. Okay. Next one 605 push fit joints. Again, the same thing. They're just clarifying both of them. And again, in 605 21, brass has been replaced. These are some of the uh, different other types of push joints. These are push joints or compressed joints. We call them shock bites and stuff like that, or, or little gasket types. Um, they hold up pretty good. Now they have them with the, the, the lip on them here. And uh, whoops, the lip on them. And you can, um, let me see if I get that back. You can uh, totally, right here, this here part here, they got a tool now. You just push it in, it takes it out. And I don't even know why I'm telling you that because you already know that. Okay, so let's go on. That's, that was a nice thing. Okay, thermal expansion control. Thermal expansion, when storage tank water heaters are supplied with cold water, okay, reduce backflow prevent a, a thermal expansion control device shall be used, okay? In other words, you have to have a thermal expansion tank on it, okay? Uh, so that's not, that's a must now, okay? Protection, uh, the question usually comes up, are you telling me how all water heaters? Uh, yeah, I guess I'm telling you, water heaters, if there's a check valve anywhere in the, in the line, yeah, I guess I got to tell you all water heaters, okay? So if there's a check valve the stream of the delivery, I don't care where it is, you have to have <clears throat> a thermal expansion tank. Uh, protection of potable water. On-site contamination, that means, that means in the house. We're not talking about outside, we're with the, the city's uh, responsible for, we're talking about in-house, in in-house. On-site contaminant, in accordance with some blah, 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 may be required by the provider of public water. So the Department of Public Water will make the discretion as if you need to check uh, RPZ valve or, or what type of RPZ valve 
you would, would need, okay? So it all depends on the provider of water. Not even the plumbing inspector does that, the provider of water, the Department of Water Supply, we're gonna call them. And it's all gonna go on the degree of hazard to protect public water supply systems. Uh, if any of you guys do sprinkler, lawn sprinkler work or anything like that, uh, uh, you can't use a double check. It must be an RPC system are considered to be high hazard. That's the number one in New York State. Um, a lot of them try to get away with it. And by the way, um, uh, you, you can't install them. You have to have a license plumber put the control valve in. And then after that, you can install your system if it's part of your system. Okay, 6084, potable water handling and treatment. <clears throat> uh, so a lot, of, a lot of new stuff here. Potable water and handling equipment. Water pumps, filters, softeners, tanks, blah, 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 blah. Be located to prevent contamination from entering the appliances and devices. Okay, so it's talking about water pumps, filters, and softeners now have to have uh, backflow, some type of backflow preventers on them. So any during the discharge cycle, anything goes wrong, you can't flow into the potable water. <clears throat> Overflow, relief, out and wasted short time of line shall determine the air gap. <clears throat> Excuse me. 6088, valves and outlets prohibited below grade. Any potable water outlet and combination stop and wait valve shall not be installed underground or below ground. A freeze-proof fire hydrant, or what they call a yard hydrant, that drains the riser into the ground is considered to be a stop and waste valve. So you can't bring them underground. And even RPVs, if they have a discharge port on them, uh, you cannot put them in a box in the ground and dig a big hole. <clears throat> that's good. that's not that's not uh, copacetic. Exception. There's always an exception to the rule with the freeze proof provider. Okay. Um, in accordance with section 613, 13, 2, and 5, the hydrants and the piping from the backflow preventer to the hydrant are identified in accordance with 608, which we'll see in a minute. Okay, so there's always an exception to the rule. <clears throat> Reutilization. Okay, water used by heating or cooling cannot be returned to the potable water line. Okay, they added the word heating in there, that was never in there. Okay, 60812. Potable water tanks, okay? They now have to have NS61. I think the other one was 64, now it's NS61 in order, and they're labeled right on the potable water tank. Pressure vacuum breaker assemblies. Pressure vacuum breaker assemblies shall comply with 1020 or the, the, B, the CSA is a Canadian standard, which is accepted here in the United States. Um, and the highlight, the new part is spill resistant vacuum breakers assemblies shall comply with 1056. That's a new number. <clears throat> These assemblies shall be installed with the critical level of the assembly located not less than 12 inches above all downstream outlets, piping in the outlets. That can be pretty high depending on where you locate it, but it's 12 inches, not the standard six inches. Okay. <clears throat> And that's a spill resistant vacuum breaker. A pressure vacuum breaker doesn't have to have that because they can have pressure downstream and they don't, this, this spillage wouldn't cause damage. Beverage dispensers. Uh, I always get into this. Um, anytime you have a beverage dispenser, it has to have some type of backflow preventer on it. Um, a coffee urn, if it's connected to the water supply, you may laugh, but even an ice, uh, uh, ice tea machine, if that ice tea machine has a cold water piping supplied to it, you must have some kind of backflow preventer on there. And I'm not talking about a, a 707 or something like that. I'm talking about the little ball valve type one, but just so nothing can go back into the, um, the uh, potable water supply system. That's the, perp the whole purpose of the whole thing. Okay, uh, beverage, all beverage dispensers, okay? Carbonated beverage dispensers, now you have to be aware 
that they must have, if you go down to the last section of 608-1711, if it's carbonated dispenser or what we call a box system, uh, it shall not be affected by carbon dioxide gas. In other words, it's got to be something that the carbon dioxide gas ain't going to burn up, uh, whether it be rubber or that, probably stainless steel or, or something else. Um, so uh, they have to be labeled for carbon dioxide gas. <clears throat> Coffee machines, not non non uh, uh, non carbonated drink dispenser. Also, they also have to have backflow preventers on them and stuff like that. So uh, beverage machines. Uh, this is a new one, brand new. Okay, um, humidifiers. Now humidifiers <clears throat> have to have. Uh, backflow protection as well. Uh, this section has been shortened up. And I think later on when we get into chapter seven, I think it even tells us now uh, they have to be uh, indirectly connected to the waistline. Um, and uh, in uh, NS, uh, NSF 58, that's telling you really that um, that addition is uh, in compliance. It allows a wider selection to be compliant. So it gives you <clears throat> more design opportunity or the designer. One, two, a sewer is required. Okay. Um, buildings in which plumbing fixtures are, okay, they have to have sewers. We all know that, okay. Uh, let's see, what do I want to do? Okay. The addition here is number one. Okay, that's uh, one through six or are added to that section, okay? One is talking about one, two, three, or different regulatory authorities, um, all six of them, all regulatory authorities, and it tells uh, about the local statute. Number six was put in there for the local building, building departments, local things, okay? And again, the notes in 7021 all deal with uh, poly, the addition of polyethylene, uh, probably polyolefin pipe, uh, the removal of brass, copper alloy pipe, etc. All those deal with those new types of materials. And as you guys know, you guys know probably better than me, there's new materials coming out, something new every day. 7032, <clears throat> drainage and fill ground. That's an addition to the code. Uh, it's an addition to the material about the um, uh, polypropylene plastic pipe. That's a new pipe, we can put, use that underground as well. 7032, I think is a modification. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, the 7034 is um, existing building sewers. Um, oh yeah, that's new. Uh, you guys that do any rehab work, if you have a building that's a uh, building sewer that's existing, um, and you're redoing the entire building. In other words, you're leaving a building the sewer underground. You're not touching the sewer, storm, or sanitary, and you're gutting the building, and you're just going to throw the plumbing in. That existing sewer must be tested and approved. Okay, um, if it's under slab, it has to be tested and approved. Um, uh, again, it has to be uh, verified. Is what the word I want to use that the piping has slope and in the correct direction. It's not broken. It don't have sags in it, and there's no obstructions in it. Okay, so uh, the way I used to do it, they used to have to call me. And I used to have to go there with the camera. They used to have a camera. They used to go through the camera. They used to clean the pipe up. It's a, it's a big hassle. And uh, by the way, you're surprised what you can see through those videos. Uh, but you have to verify they are not broken and stuff before you're allowed to continue. Um, that's new. <clears throat> 7041. Slope. Uh, the horizontal drain pipe. This is... Um, uh, an ad uh, addition here, and it's uh, <clears throat> for grease interceptors, except grease interceptors. Okay, go to the last sentence, that's the new part. Um, except that where the drainage piping is upstream of a grease interceptor, the slope of the piping shall be not less than one quarter inch pitch per foot or 2% slope. So that's what it means, okay? Um, not less than that indicated in the table, except a drainage pipe upstream from the grease system. Okay. 7042, reduction in pipe size in the direction of flow. 
that's been in the code for 200 years if you can't reduce the pipe size and flow. Um, and that's the same in storm as well. Okay, in storm water, you can't reduce the size either. Uh, number one, a four inch by three inch water closet plant is not considered to be a reduction in size. Um, I don't even know why you would use that personally. Um, a water closet then fitting, having a four inch inlet and a three inch outlet, we call them water closet then, provided a four inch leg of the fitting is upright. Uh, again, I don't understand why you would do that when they have three inch flanges today, um, but who knows, okay? And three, an offset closet flange is considered a reduction, uh, is not considered a reduction in size. Okay, however, that's not true all the way. If you look at the offset brass flange or copper alloy flange, no reduction in size. Okay, if you look at the one with the red ring or lower right hand corner, that's an offset flange, no reduction in size. The black one with the silver ring in the middle, lower middle, 45 degree flange, not a problem. Now, the white the white one on the left lower vein and the cast iron flange, okay? That cast iron flange cannot, at least the one that I took the picture of, which I have the picture of, does not have a clear opening. So you get a lot of stoppage with that one. That one it would be illegal. The cast iron, the plastic one, they fixed, if you can see, and let me see if I can get it out for you. Uh, I did it, I screwed it up. Just give me a second here. Okay, okay, let me just show you this here. This here part right here, that comes out a lot more and it's rounded. So uh, when the, the waste products go down there, it has a clear shot of the waste. With this one up here, it comes out flat. And this is where you had all the problems with it. The other ones were all legal. <clears throat> now, I don't know if you know it, um, I guess many of you guys, when you're doing your big jobs and stuff like that, you like to get your your wax seals and cases, okay? Please be careful where they come from. Uh, if you look at that gasket, okay, that's a approved gasket. That's a good wax gasket. You can use them. Um, and the other ones kind of have like um, uh, a deep, deep red one, okay? There, some of them are approved, but you have a lot of them out there that are not approved. They do not have a rating on them. The rating has to have an ASM 11243. <clears throat> All wax gaskets now have to have this uh, uh, antibacterial stuff in it, okay? And that's what makes them uh, uh, approved. Where the older ones you have, um, they don't have that. Um, and <laughs> just be thankful I'm not your inspector. I was at Disney and a big mistake a guy made is he, he left some of his wax gaskets on a job. He was setting 120 water closets in a hotel. And um, I went over to inspect them because we do the uh, um, flange inspection, something you guys probably don't do. We do a in flange inspection. And I checked one of the set bowls and I looked down and I saw the box for the wax gasket. And it was from, uh, let's just say another state, okay? Another country rather. And uh, I looked at it and I didn't see on the box an ASTM standard. Now I know you're all gonna hate me and say I'm against contractors, but uh, I made them take out 27 water closets and put the right seals in, okay? Because it was on his contract that he had to use approved seal. So I'm, I'm really not a nice guy, okay? But uh, I really am a nice guy, I should say, okay? So, um, uh, uh, how to do what I had to do. Okay, let's go on. Next one, okay. Sanitary drainage. <clears throat> Brass has been deleted, popular airplanes have new, new, we use that a lot. Um, Brass has been replaced with copper alloy. You can see that in your material section. Um, plus pipe and tubing to other piping materials. Okay, this, this one here, this is a good one. 705. <clears throat> When joining pipes of different plastic pipes shall be made with approved adaptive fitting or by solvent cement joint only, where a single is made between ABS and PVC pipes at the end of the building train and the beginning of the building sewer. So what they are allowing you to do now, and only in one case, 
is when you're coming out of the building classic, whether it be ABS or PVC, and you're going to tie into SDR or, or maybe PVC and, and ABS, that is the only place and only one joint can you use a transition cement, okay? And that transition cement must have that ASTM rating on the can, E3138, and there is one out there and it is improved, okay? So that is the only place that you can do that, okay? Uh, okay, so uh, I know that's probably gonna cause a lot of uh, things. Okay. So let's just see here. Do drinking fountains need backflows? Okay. Uh, drinking fountains do not need backflows because they have an air gap in the spout. Okay. Uh, and the has, air gap has to be twice the uh, distance from the outlet of the faucet to the, um, the uh, of the basin, we'll call it. Okay. Uh, I hope that answers your question. If not, just get right back to me. Okay. Um, next one. Uh, let me let me rephrase. Okay. You said drinky fountains. Okay. Now, if you ice machines do need backflow preventers. Okay. Um, however, the older style ice machines do need backflow preventers because there is no air gap inside the ice chamber. So you need the air gap on the outside of the machine. The newer ones all have them built into the machine, okay? And as an inspector, he'll always want to see the paperwork where you're gonna to have to take the cover off because you can visually see that. So I hope I didn't misinterpret your question. So I wanted to clear that up, okay? And by the way, the drain from the uh, ice maker machine, that must be by air break, or air gap, not air break, okay? That needs to have an air gap, not an air break. You cannot go into the pipe. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Okay, I hope, hopefully I answered your question. Uh, plastic pipe, PVC, okay, we did that one. Okay, oh. here we go. This, 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 this uh, I, I can't tell you how many times, uh, how much time I spend on this and, and that's when I teach the uh, journeyman and the masters, okay? There's two types of glue joints. There's a solvent cement joint, which where you take primer, I don't care what primer is, it's primer, and it's the glue or solvent cement. And you put them on the pipe, okay? The solvent, the, the, the primer uh, softens up and, and, and has a chemical reaction to the PVC or the ABS, which are one you're using. And then when you put the glue on, you twist it, that quarter of a turn, locks it in, it actually grips it, and it becomes a solvent weld. That's why it's called solvent weld joint. Very, very, very small chance of that leaking. The only way that's gonna leak is if you got water on that joint, okay? However, a glue joint is not a solvent weld joint. Please don't get a mix. You can put all the glue on that pipe and you can put it in and you put it in and it's only glue. It could be air bubbles in there, it could be dirt in there, it could be whatever else, but glue don't clean dirt, okay? Uh, there could be water in there, glue and water don't mix, oil and water don't mix, okay? So all that kind of stuff, okay? Now I showed you here in the drawing, if you look at the picture, if you look at it, those are some glue joints that were taken apart, okay? And if you can look, look at some of them, um, uh, one guy, uh, yeah, you can look at him himself and you can criticize him all you want, um, but uh, that's what happens. That's what you don't see with glue joints. If you look at the uh, drainage connection between the ABS and the PVC, and they use this so-called blue cement, this so-called uh, glue wall cement, okay? Um, I have nothing to do. That green can is the approved can that happens to be Oatly, and it does have the ASTM rating on it. It has been previous cans that do not have the ASTM rating on. Um, one other thing I really want to get, um, I, I have to do this, okay, because this costs people a lot of money. Um, there's a glue out there that's blue, okay? Uh, it's supposed to go with water. It sort of mixes with water. Let me tell you something, there's no glue, there's no cleaner glue that mixes with water, okay? You're supposed to be able to put it in pressurized and test it, okay? 
Last I heard, that still does not have an ASTM number. I haven't checked. Well, I said mine. I haven't checked six months, seven months. Okay, that is illegal glue. You cannot join your sprinkler pipes or your your lawn irrigation pipes with that type of glue. Okay, as, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, um, so that's it. And then they got all kinds of glue. Again, the important thing of the glue is that it has that ASTM number. Okay. Um, and that it, uh, uh, the ASTM number is 3138. And please be careful and don't be fooled. Just because CAN says conforms to ASTM 3128 doesn't mean it is 3128. It has to have ASTM D 3168 on the CAN, not conforms to. That, that, that has not been tested or approved. Okay? Um, that's, a, that's a big no no. Okay. Oh, one thing we're on plastic pipes. And I, 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 this, is, this is why I like live, live, because I can see the reaction. Okay. You guys use that, uh, that tool when you have a glue joint where if uh, you need to change something, you uh, home it out and uh, clean it out or bore it out or whatever the hell you want to call it. Um, it it's interesting. Um, and if you use that, don't make it an inspection job. And don't do it while the inspector's coming and doing an inspection. Please, that's not good. You change the whole diameter, inside diameter, outside diameter of the pipe. You, you, you have to put twice the amount of glue in there to, to get it. To, it that's illegal. You, you can't use that. They, they come up with everything. I, I just have to say that. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Here now. All right. Sanitary drainage. Prohibited joints and connections. Okay, number five, solvent cement joints between different types of plastic pipe, except where provided in 705.16.4, are illegal. You cannot do it. The only place you can use, well, and I'm going to just call it a glue joint, okay, or a solvent cement joint, okay, is if it's non pressure. For example, Drainage is non-pressure. Venting is non-pressure. <clears throat> Once you have a sump pump or a sewage ejector, some of that line is pressure. Pressure draining. So therefore, you cannot use a glue joint. You must use the purple primer, and it has to be purple still, and that, okay? And same thing with water lines, okay? All right, that, that will clear up that, okay? Conversion of GPM flow to DFUs, okay, um, where discharges to, uh, to a waste receptor or to a drainage system are only known in gallons per minute. Uh, okay, one GPM just equals two fixed yields. If every gallon per minute of flow on a pump into the drainage system, that's what you designate as a fixture unit value, not how many fixtures are connected. The fixtures connected are rated for the tank. When the pump starts discharging, it's rated into the drainage system. Another thing, unless you have a pneumatic sewage ejector, there is zero differential pressure in the venting system. You do not need to run that vent directly through the roof. They are electric pumps in a sewage ejector system. The pump is underground, pump kicks on, sucks up the water. There is no pressure differential. That vent from the top of that tank to go right back into the uh, gravity drainage system, six inches above highest fixture it serves, you know, the, the same thing as, as, as everything else. And by the way, that vent don't even have to be two inch. You look at the venting chart on the code, it can probably be inch and a quarter, inch and a half. And you say, but the hole's two inch. Yeah, the hole's two inch. So you're reducing gasket, what's the difference? It depends on what's easier for you to, to run the line, okay? Uh, I'd much rather use smaller pipes, smaller holes to drill all the rest, okay? So, um, uh, that, okay. Does primer still have to be purple? Okay, Rich, let me, let me, let me tell you, uh, the primer only has to be purple when it's an inspection job and it's on pressure rate. I mean, that hasn't changed. If you want to use primer on your non-pressure drainage, it doesn't have to be purple. You can use, uh, you can use regular primer. Okay, uh, under the uh, sinks, uh, a lot of guys like to use the, the primer under your sink because it's all messy. 
Um, no, that can be that can be all regular. It doesn't have to have any color to it. The only color it has to have is when it's on a pressure pressure system, and it's over four inch. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Okay. Okay, did you hear me answer that question, Rich? Type me back because I don't know if I did it right. Okay, anyway, uh, I'll, I'll do it again just quick. Uh, yeah, it has to be purple. If it's on pressure system, if it's not on a pressure system, you could use primer, but it doesn't have to be purple. The inspector's not going to care. He's only going to look for the water test. Okay, uh, again, okay, got it. Good, thank you. Okay, okay. Okay, let's go on. Uh, are we on? Okay, fix your units. Okay, uh, I already did that one. Okay, sumps and ejectors, the sump pit. Okay, there's no major change here in the sump pit. Okay, uh, the big thing in the sump pit is um, that you have ready access to it. Okay, uh, and also the sump pit shall be fitted with a gas tight cover. And that's a cat saw not more than two inches below grade or floor level. Okay, it has to be accessible. Uh, and remember something, uh, usually when you take those on a sewage ejector, not necessarily a clear sump, but a sewage ejector, once you take those covers off, you have to put a gasket on it, okay? Especially if they because they got to be gas tight, okay? Uh, let's go on, okay. Okay, capacity, okay. A sewer pump and sewer generator have the cap it has to meet the requirements. That's not uh, important, okay? They have to be able to uh, eat up uh, up to two inches of solid. Um, uh, oh, and oh, yeah, that's a capable of handling severe and diameter of up to including a half inch. Oh, that, that was new. That half inch is new. It used to be one inch. So they, they put it down to a small capacity. By the way, I mentioned those, um, those uh, macerating toilets before. They are good. I, I, I kind of like them. But they, we, we used to use them a couple of places uh, on, on big jobs. Um, uh, and, and non residentials we use them too. But the only negative thing about them is you got to make sure the homeowners know or the people know that they cannot throw paper towels or sanitary napkins down there because you're going to, you'll be there every day. Okay. Uh, they, they're not made for that. Okay. All right. Let's go into the next one 716 replacement of underground buildings and building drains by pipe bursting methods. Okay, uh, this is not new um, in, in where I come from in Florida. We, we've been doing this for many, many years. Okay, uh, in New York, it's, it's kind of new. And the reason is we don't want to dig up the streets. Okay, uh, so um, uh, we have a lot of uh, we have some uh, changes here. Okay, so building sewer, building drain. That's why we do it. Okay. It, it allows no excavation on roadways, one opening on one side, one over there. I know you guys got a special name for that over here, but uh, this is how the sewer is done, okay? Uh, that's a 12 inch uh, SDR line uh, uh, that they're breaking, that they break easy. And the thing about them, you don't even have to do any digging. It just, as it pulls it through, it just hydraulically busts the pipe, cast iron, I don't care what the kind of, I don't care what the pipe is. It just busts the pipe wide open and uh, it packs it to the earth. And as it's coming, it's dragging the new HDP pipe right, right with it. Okay, so. Um, uh, okay, let's go, let's go on, okay. Okay, uh, that's the bowl, that's the prick, okay. Notice the sharp edge on it. Uh, and yeah, I wonder if they, by the way, I just want to mention something. 
this way is a lot better than lining. I'm, I'm not very big on pipelining, especially sewer lining. Uh, to me, they're only good for a temporary installation. Um, uh, and because I've seen them collapse too often and they've, they've done a great job. So it's, it's just a lot of uh, stuff. To, by the way, uh, also with this pipeline, the stuff that is coming out today, technology, um, when I was at Disney, um, we had one of the um, you know, Hawaiian villages over there. Um, there are copper pipes got all pinholes in them all over the place. So we had a company come in and what they did is believe it or not, they lined the water, hot and cold water distribution pipings in the wall under pressure with the specialized stuff. And it works. And you're not gonna fix any leaks or anything like that. You're not gonna put a torch to it anymore after that. You have to use shark bites and stuff like that. So, uh, but it was very interesting. Uh, that, was, that was an eye-opening thing, but they even do water piping now, lining. Okay, uh, 7, 16, 12. Okay, uh, oh, got caught up here. Hang on, 7, 16, 12. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, healthcare plumbing. Okay. By the way, healthcare plumbing is taken totally deleted as a code. Uh, they, they, were, they were in conflict too much with the other codes. Uh, 716. Um, uh, pipe HDPE pipe is in there. They now have that. Uh, a lot of HDP pipe going in for uh, building sewers. Uh, indirect waste. Chapter 8. Indirect waste. Okay. Um, this chapter governs, uh, the addition of this chapter on indirect waste is humidifiers. They now have to be indirectly connected to the drainage system, okay? And protection on the water supply, if you have a water supply to them or to some type of special function or something, humidification function, uh, like to uh, uh, air conditioning humidifier or something like that, you have to have backflow prevention on them now, okay? Um, so uh, that's if it has no air gap, of course. Okay, next one is uh, where are they required humidifiers? So, uh, indirect the inception to section three, you don't need that. Materials and joints, again, materials and joints uh, change. Um, uh, it goes with chapter seven. Indirect waste piping is chapter seven drainage. And, and by the way, so is stormwater. A lot of guys don't understand that all the rules for drainage, chapter seven, apply to chapter, I think it's 11, stormwater. It's the some materials and everything, because drainage is just another form, uh, uh, stormwater is another form of drainage. This is my favorite one. Hopefully I'm gonna make you guys some money now. Okay, 80243, connection to a laundry to a span pile. It says, it's brand new, as an alternative for a laundry tray fixture, connecting directly to a drainage system, a laundry tray, Waistline without a trap shall connect to the standpipe for an automatic clothes dryer, washer drain, standpipe, and shall extend not less than 30 inches and blah, 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 blah. Okay, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna show you this slide. I want you to look at it. And if you have any questions, or if you think I'm crazy, you let me know. Because this is what you can do now. Look at it. So what do you think? By doing it this way, you don't have to worry about the three inch drain line that the washing machine connects into. Okay, so um, no trap on the laundry sink. Okay, do I got you guys, am I connected? Okay. Yep, you're all set. Okay, I guess something happened to my sound here. Okay, so uh, hopefully that, uh, by the way, I've been using this for five years now in, in all the residential homes we put in. Uh, I use this, it's great. Um, I still put my, my stand pipe in the wall. I rough it out in the wall 
and I put a T coming out and I come with a dirty arm right over to the laundry tray. As long as I can meet those, those uh, minimum requirements, it's perfectly legal. And if we look at it, it's nothing, it's the same thing as a, as a combination sink and waste. Uh, you know, there's really no, uh, not too much there. Okay. Okay, let's go on. Vent terminals, roof extension. Okay. Um, roof, just give me a minute. I got a, it's a break. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay, roof extension. Okay, um, New York code again, NY specific. They finally put the uh, number in. It's 18 inches. The vent has to uh, extend above it. Uh, prohibited installations. Okay, let's talk a little bit about air admittance valves. Okay, they just cleared up some stuff with the air admittance valves. Um, there's been a lot of stuff. Can an air maintenance valve be used on a pump or whatever? Well, if you look at the bottom, they kind of clarify that. Uh, air maintenance valves shall not be used to vent sumps or tanks, except where the vent system for the sump or tank has been designed by an engineer. An admittance valve shall not be installed on outdoor vent terminals for the sole purpose of reducing clearances to gravity air intakes to mechanical air intakes. Uh, a lot of people, believe it or not, on the roof terminals, they were putting air, um, AAVs or, or air mittens out on the stack terminal because the uh, air uh, the um, air conditioning units, the intake units, was, was, so they thought that would happen, but now you can't do that. That don't work. That just doesn't work. Oh, they traps and interceptors. Okay. Um, Don, uh, you asked a question about a two-inch trap. I don't know. Can you be, uh, why don't you type me in some more? The drinking fountain uh, strap. I don't know what, what you mean by two-inch strap. Okay, just give me some more information, please. Okay, uh, food waste and disposal uh, restrictions on food waste disposal. A food waste disposal shall not discharge into a grease. I don't know why they did that. That's been in the code. They just changed some fancy wording, um, whatever. Okay, um, oh, this is another one, additive degrees interceptors. Okay, um, you know, some of these guys, and maybe some of you guys do too, you sell these kinds of emulsifiers and all this kind of stuff that you can put into a grease trap and into a grease, none of that stuff works. The only thing that works is microbiomes. Uh, microbes uh, is the only thing that enhance the aerobatic action. Anaerobatic and aerobatic, they eat each other up and they eat up the grease, the same thing, almost the same as a, a septic system. Okay, um, they do not allow, if you look at the last sentence, systems that discharge emulsifiers, chemicals, or enzymes 
to Greece interceptors shall be prohibited. Okay. Greece interceptors, okay. Um, this, this has really been the last few years, this has really, uh, in, in commercial kitchens and stuff like that, I, I, I did a lot of commercial kitchens and I inspected a, a super lot of commercial kitchens. And um, these fog, we call them fog side oil and grease disposal systems are fantastic, okay? Oh, no more of those stupid traps, opening them traps up, getting overcome by odor and passing out. Uh, so they're really good, okay? Um, it, re it reduces all of the, 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 the labor involved. Um, there's two types. There's the gravity type and there's the hydrochemical type. I happen to like the hydrochemical type, or the hydromechanical type, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, the gravity ones are the big 500 gallon tanks, 1,000 gallon tanks. Uh, we had a couple of them in Disney with 2,500 gallon of grease interceptors. That's a big tank. Um, and uh, so you know what it is, okay? Uh, what else is doing that for, man? Come on. Okay, that's one of the smaller ones, okay? And that's a great tank. Um, that's, that's great. If you see the little uh, discharge port, Inside there is what kind of like, a, I'm just going to call it a basket on a wheel. And um, everything in there, um, uh, the, the key to that is time. The, the, everything has to stay in that tank time so everything can solidify and separate. Then the water drains out through the, the, um, the drainage pipe and the stuff goes up to the top. As the stuff goes up to the top, there's this um, like a basket and it, so it turns on a wheel. And then it, it brings all the grease into this bucket here. And then once the, the owner or whoever is in charge of the uh, kitchen, he sees that bucket's full, he just slides another bucket in there, takes that bucket outside. There's a special dumpster, special area where he puts that dumpster, where he puts that bucket in. They pick it up. The, the fat recycling companies pick it up. Oh, fantastic. Uh, you, I wonder if any of you guys can see a violation on that that I picked up. I wonder if you can see a violation on that. I pick up all violations. The bank connection. They have it six inches above the grease trap. It's supposed to be six inches above the sink it serves. Okay? So anyway, but uh, yeah, they had to change it. Okay. Um, so that, they, that, that, that's a great, there's quite a few different types of them out today. Um, Okay, here, storm drainage. Oh, no longer do we size storm drainage anymore, okay? Uh, storm drainage is no more by square foot of water. We do not size it that way. Um, we size it by GPMs. How many gallons of water is gonna drain off the roof in a given amount of time? So what we do is we have a little more of what we call flow control roofing, uh, flow control drainage. I used to do an awful lot of that flow control drainage when we did a lot of work in Manhattan. Uh, the roofs up there in Manhattan, we did a little old fashioned style where we had the big beehive strainers. Uh, as the water accumulated, the holes got bigger on the strainer and drained them out. <clears throat> but um, uh, today, everything is done. Um, and now they have the uh, roof drains. If you buy a roof drain, I'm sure you know about it, that they, um, they sell them by GPM now. Okay. And they even have the double ones. The double ones have to be, I think it's two inches higher than the. Uh, and uh, then the primary, the primary and then the secondary is two inches higher. <clears throat> uh, 1102, uh, clean out. Clean out shall be provided the same as a drainage system in any stormwater system. Uh, power pit walls, this is new. Um, it's not new, but they've changed it a little bit. Go down, you can see the highlighted section I have. It says, scupper openings shall be not less than four inches in height and have a width that is equal to or greater than the circumference of the roof drain size for the same roof. Okay, so usually they only told us the minimum opening of a scupper was four inch. Okay, now it, it has to have a length and a width. So now they're telling you that the height of the scupper cannot be smaller than four inches. Okay, now that's, that's, uh, that's, that's 
a change. Sump pit, okay, again, for stormwater, it's the same thing, it's no different than the injector, it just has to have access to it. Non-potable water supply. Okay, components and materials. Okay, this is very big now uh, because of the green issue, the green code, stuff like that. Um, uh, New York is trying to uh, get more non-potable water type systems. Okay, uh, I don't know how many of you are involved in this, but it's, it's up and coming. So you, you're gonna wanna look into it, especially uh, if you do a lot of uh, new types of work because even housing developments where they're, they're going to be using all of this. <clears throat> okay. Uh, okay. Components and materials. Okay. The highlighted part, the new part of this is, and by the way, they're adding on to this every code cycle they add to this. Last code cycle 2015 was the beginning. They introduced it. Now they're kind of ironing out some stuff and getting more specific. Okay. So components and materials. Uh, Materials shall be uh, approved by the manufacturer for intended application. Now they put the intended application in there for a very, very uh, uh, important word because when you see, we're gonna use, we're gonna have a lot of different uses for non potable water, okay? Um, number one and number three are additions to, to the modification, okay? Uh, one, one is a, Protection for UV exposure, because it's probably gonna be outside. And uh, two and three, sun barriers, uh, garages, crawl spaces, space like that. So they have special uh, additions and special locations where the storage tank is going to be. Hey, these storage tanks, a small one, 800 gallons, or that's a very small one. So <clears throat> access, okay? Um, they are, uh, the tanks have to have access. And they have minimum dimensions for uh, manholes, 24 inches square inside diameter. In other words, the person really has to get in there sometime to clean them out or whatever they have to do. Can't have bacteria building up in there, et cetera, that kind of stuff. Um, manholes have to be secure. <clears throat> they gotta be naturally kept uh, from freezing, okay? Um, the exception is uh, important here on, on this, uh, this here slide. Um, treated water storage tanks that are less than 800 gallons in volume and installed below grade shall not be required to be equipped with a manhole, provided the tank has a service port of not less than eight inches. So as long as there's some way to clean them out, steam them out, or, or I'm sorry, or pressure them out. Draining the tanks, all tanks have, shall have a means of emptying the contents for the purpose of serving and cleaning, okay? Um, that um, uh, shall have, that means it's a must, okay? Okay, part of the water, what's the big tier? Oh, the standard, ASTM 2635 is the big standard here. It's been added for clarification, uh, uh, allows the uh, other approved methods of non potable water collection. So what that's doing is it's, it's, it's allowing us, um, that's uh, 13022, is allowing us how we can collect non-potable water, okay? Uh, or reuse water. By the way, they're, they're fooling around with these terms, reuse, uh, gray water, non-potable water. So they already did away with gray water. <clears throat> bypass valve, all, all tanks have to have a bypass valve. So in case uh, it happens and it floods over, we can get rid of it and dump it out. And then, so it says bypass valve shall be provided with access that flows for removal. This is a typical um, um, treatment, uh, wastewater, wastewater treatment center, non-potable water. You got your uh, potable going to all your fixtures, and then you got your drain or your gray water coming out of your fixtures. And uh, all of those fixtures there, those drains, you got the uh, bathtub, shower, dishwasher, washing machine, lavatory, they can all go into the tank membrane reactor, it's called biomembrane reactor, okay? And then what happens is from there, water goes out, goes up, and it can be reclaimed. It can go back into the washing machine, it can go back into the water closet, and it can go into your irrigation, which is considered to be black water, <clears throat> okay? Uh, and then you'll see your drain from your water closet cannot go into the uh, 
recycled water, okay? Uh, by the way, these have filters on them. They have a makeup water into them. They have chemicals that uh, may have to go into them depending on it. So there's a lot of uh, more stuff that is in here. There's a very simplistic drawing. Um, a lot of your, uh, <clears throat> your larger, uh, not larger is not the word, more expensive um, one family homes are putting these in, okay? Um, uh, be because uh, water, like in Florida, water is, you know, it's, uh, we use all well water, but it comes through the city, but it's, it's, it's just, they, they want to recycle the water, recredit the water and stuff like that. Um, uh, especially with the irrigation, Florida, 99.9% .9 of all Florida irrigation is recycled water. <clears throat> okay, now also, we, get, we got the way we could collect water from uh, reuse water from uh, fixtures. Now we're going to talk about rainwater collection system. This is totally another type of system they came up with. Okay, rainwater. Okay, so they're going to take all the rainwater. Okay, and it comes off of roofs and stuff like that. Uh, they bring them into retention ponds. I'm sure you've seen them. Florida, we have hundreds of retention ponds. I got one right behind my house. Um, and what we do is that, that water from the retention pond goes into a pumping station. And again, it's always it's got some kind of filtration and stuff like that. And uh, it comes out and we have a purple pipe system for all of our irrigation. <clears throat> okay, now the interesting thing is uh, we also here in Florida use rainwater or I'm gonna say re reuse water because more than just rainwater. We use it for fire protection. Our sprinkler systems now uh, all are loaded with uh, um, reuse water or, or uh, uh, non-potable water. Uh, our fire hydrants are non-potable fire hydrants. We have non-potable water mains. Uh, the, the, the issue is, and the only issue is with these, you have to have the storage facility to um, maintain that. Uh, and I think it's 80% or 75% of Disney in the Florida, all their fire protection systems are uh, recycled water. As a matter of fact, you go to the recycling plant and the, the guy who manages it will tell you that um, uh, that water that comes out of their recycling plant is 95% pure water. He actually took a cup and drank it right in front of me. I wouldn't, but he did, but good for him. Okay, I wonder why he looked a little funny, but that's okay. Okay, collection surfaces. <clears throat> Rainwater shall be collected only from above ground impervious roofing surfaces constructed from approved materials and where approved vehicular parking or pedestrian walking thing. Now, they usually don't collect it from vehicular parking because of oil spills and or gasolines and, and that kind of stuff. But there has to be an approved type uh, parking area. Um, so, but that's where they get them. And what they do is it's, uh, they just bring it to a, a, a reservoir type thing or a catch basin or uh, retention pond and they just use it there. <clears throat> uh, and it's very interesting, these rainwater systems, you know, you, you got what we're getting, okay? <clears throat> there's there's, there's, a, there's a, a typical rainwater system for a, a, a small residential place, okay? You see the tank in the ground in the lower left-hand corner. I, I, should, I gotta make those bigger. Um, that could be um, for a sprinkler system, you can use it, washing your car, uh, that kind of stuff, and you can break there, recycle gray water. Then you got plants, you got the larger ones, and then you got the uh, recycling complexes. That's all recycled water uh, through aeration and stuff like that. <clears throat> Debris excludes now, okay? We understand that when we get rainwater, there's gonna be a lot of stuff, leaves, stuff going in there, they go into the sewer, they, they come. So what happens now at the collection point or at the collection disposal center? Uh, they have what they call debris excluders. Downspouts and leaders shall be connected to a debris excluder or equivalent device. What it does, it separates everything. It's kind of like a sewage treatment plant, okay? It's designed to remove leaves, sticks, pine needles, and similar debris, and it prevents them from entering the storage tank. Highly main, high maintained thing, and it's gotta be cleaned very often, and actually they clean it with recycled water. <clears throat> then they got something called wash. Diverters and they operate automatically and they don't rely anything on any manually operated valves or devices. And it's a very serene water and through pressure and stuff like that. 
Um, it's it's a phenomenal system to see. If I were you guys, if you had a chance, just to see one in action. I don't know of any in New York, so I can't help you with that. If you do, let me know, because I'd like to do it. They got pumping stations. Um, they provided access. Um, the rainwater, again, it's, it's just how they collect rainwater, how it has to do. That's a typical uh, rainwater system for a, a housing complex, okay? That's how they do it. They got the big tank outside. You put it on and it comes right off the roof. In Florida, we have a heck of a lot of water, okay? Um, and I can fill one of those tanks up, and we're in the rain season now. Rain for two hours, and uh, we get three inches of rain, four inches of rain. Um, and uh, matter of fact, it fills my pool up all the time. I got to keep draining my pool into the retention pond. Okay, so that's uh, basically really uh, uh, what's going on. And uh, the other thing uh, I want to mention our uh, rainwater too. I forgot. Okay. All right, gentlemen. I hope I didn't bore you to sleep. I hope you didn't go to sleep on me. Okay. Uh, but uh, that's all, folks. And if you have any questions, I'd like to uh, you can entertain them. If you want to uh, write them in, I'll stay a couple minutes and add them or whatever you want. It's up to you. Allison, it's your show or the guys, whatever you want to do. Yeah, everyone has the um, ability to ask questions right now if they want. Um, I know a lot of people are asking questions throughout, so that's awesome. Um, if anyone doesn't have any more questions, oh, we hold on, I think we got one, nope. Um, I think that's it. Thank you so much, Al, that was awesome. Um, okay, good. And I hope everyone has a fabulous okay. evening. You too, stay safe, people. Hope to see you soon. Take yes, care. Yes, you too, stay Bye -bye. well. Bye, everyone.